entire focus is, is the well-being and the advancement of my students. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 224. Today, we're here with Grandmaster James Ferrelli. This is going to be a good one. I want you to stick around. I want you to listen to everything we're going to learn today from this man. But first, let me tell you who I am. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, and I'm your host on the show. I'm the lucky guy that gets to interview all of these wonderful folks, and I'm an even luckier guy because my job is around running this great company where we build products and offer services to the traditional martial artists of the world. If you're new to the show, you can check out all the show notes and all the 223 other episodes that we have at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check out the products we make at whistlekick.com. I'm really excited to announce a new project. We've been working on this behind the scenes, and it's finally time to let you know about it. Marshalljournal.com. What is Marshall Journal? Marshall Journal is the only place where we are bringing together all of the folks that we've been able to connect with through the last few years of this company, through this show, to produce some of the best writing on the traditional martial arts, and we're putting it all in one place. There's no fee. Nobody's getting paid. This entire project is just a, a labor of love, if you will. I like to write about martial arts, and we've talked to quite a few other people on this show that also love to write about martial arts. We've been working behind the scenes. The first few pieces went up, and we continued to work on it and revise it, and now it's ready. MarshallJournal.com. Check it out. If you're interested in contributing something, head on over there. We have the submission instructions. We're trying to make this the number one place for people to check out the writing from some of the most prominent or insightful or passionate martial artists around the world. Hope you check it out. Hope you like it. And that's that. <laughs> if you don't, hey, it's free, and I'll refund the cost of admission. On today's show, we have Grandmaster James Ferrelli. If you experience a life-threatening or career-ending situation, whether that's at work or in military service, you're probably going to take it easy. If you're training in the martial arts, it's not unlikely that you'd stop completely. Grandmaster James Frehley is not that man. He continued in his art of Hapkido and found a passion for passing on his knowledge. Grandmaster Frehley's story is nothing short of inspiring, and his origin story seems like it's straight out of a comic book. But it's not my job to tell his story. It's our opportunity to hear him tell it himself. Let's welcome him to the show. Grandmaster Ferrelli, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so very much for having me. Oh, thank you for joining me here. This is an honor. It's, it's, it's fun. You know, I, listeners, we won't get into the, the background of how this all got, got set up, but uh, this one's going to be fun. So I'll, yes, sir. I'll say no more there. Uh, we're, we're here to find out about you and... We start at the beginning because I'm a logical left brain person and that's how I like to start things. How did yep. you become a martial Makes artist? Perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> how did you become a martial artist? What was your, your origin story, if you will? I um I immigrated to the United States from Germany in 1971 when I was 10 years old. Um, I was born a German citizen. My mother later married an American who was uh, an American soldier who was very, very abusive. And when I was 10, we got stationed in the United States at Fort Bragg. Um, two months after I got here, um, I started training uh, with my instructor, Grandmaster Jimmy Brown, who has been my lifelong instructor until uh, it's been, it's coming up now in 10 years since he passed. But um, he literally saved me. Uh, he personally put a stop to the abuse. He eventually ended up taking me in and raising me as his own. Um, so... Um, I'm sure you can understand that that you know that the impact he had on my life was profound. Um, I would have, with no positive male influence in my life, I probably would have gone down a much different road. Um, I, I have an addictive personality, which translates as whatever it happens to be that I'm into, I have to be 110 percent. So if it had, if I had taken a different course, that would have been drugs or prison or whatever. Um, but fortunately, you know, God smiled on me and, and put him in my life and he was, he was an amazing man. Um, 
and taken from us much too soon you know, by cancer at, at the young age of 63. Um, so it, it is, it was profound, but he is, although I worked out with some great martial artists over the years and, and some very famous and infamous ones, he was my father and my instructor and everything else and everyone else would come second to that. Um, so he, you know, he, he was very, he was a great impact on my life. Yeah. I, I, I can hear it in your voice. I can hear the emotion. Certainly many of us know the bond that we build with, with a good instructor and and anyone that's been an instructor likely knows what the other side of that bond feels like. But you had something a lot deeper, something, you know, I, I use the term origin story, sort of tongue in cheek. It kind of evokes this, this imagery of being in a comic book or, or, you know, some kind of fantasy story. But yours was almost a comic book cliche, you know, almost, uh, almost uh, taken uh, in and, and raised not only as a person, but as a martial artist by the same man. But I'm curious about before that, you know, was this some complete fluke? I mean, how, how did you find him or how did he find you? It was actually a, a complete fluke right behind our housing area. We lived on base right behind our housing area. Fort Bragg had just built this. We're talking about 1971, had just built a brand new hospital, a high rise, you know, 10 story hospital called Womack Army Hospital. Subsequently, that left what was called the old hospital area. Um, abandoned. Um, most large bases, I, I was never under, never quite sure why they did this, but most large bases, the hospitals they built in the World War II era were all one story and they covered huge expanses of land connected by corridors. They were all one story building and they just had this huge maze of corridors. Well, since they built a new hospital, um, that was a place for you know little kids to hang out. Um, and I didn't have a lot of supervision. Um, and Although most of the buildings didn't have any power, it was March, when I, March 6th when I started training. And we were, you know, throwing rocks and busting windows out of these old buildings. And, and But in the distance, um, there was power in a building. There were lights on. And me and this other little kid went and looked in the window, and it was a martial arts school. And we walked in and sat and watched the class, and we were quite enamored with it. And at that point, there wasn't a single child in the school. They were all adult soldiers and a couple of wives. And, of course, we went home, wanted to start training. Um, my stepfather, um, uh, like every little boy, I had done everything, started football, soccer, everything, and quit everything, like a lot of little boys do. And he said, you know, by God, this you will not quit. No, 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 I won't quit. So me and the little kid started training, and the little kid was very heavy. Well, training was very, very difficult. Um, it was freezing because it was March, and my instructor, he, he didn't use heat, had the windows up so the cold air was coming in. Um, and two weeks later, the, the other little kid quit. And so of course I quit too. Well, that got me quite the beating. And the sickest part of that was after the beating, which broke my two front teeth out at the age of 10, he sent me to class like that. So I'm sitting there, um, in front of the school waiting for everybody to get there. I have my little uniform on blood dripping on it. And, um, my instructor and, uh, and, Coincidentally, who was the assistant instructor at the time was Grandmaster Jim McMurray, who was in Texas with uh, the um, House of Discipline Martial Arts Federation. But he was the assistant at the time. He was only 21 years old, just come from Vietnam. Well, my instructor, uh, Grandmaster Brown, saw me, saw what happened, and put me in the car, took me home. He had never met my parents. Um, took me home, walked in. Now, my, my stepfather outranked him militarily by a substantial amount. So he could have gotten himself in a lot of trouble, but he walked in their house without knocking and he was a very very big black man big like incredible hulk size big and he grabbed my stepfather and tossed him around a little bit and uh told him if he ever touched me again he would kill him now i didn't even know he knew i existed i'd only been training two weeks um you know but uh so he got my mother and we went to the hospital they capped my teeth and it took all night to do that and the next morning um I, the whole night i'm thinking that this is great that he tossed him around but i had to go home and face this man so uh, I'm dead. Well, the next morning came and he asked my mother, could I go home with him for the weekend? And she said, yeah. And that weekend turned into the next seven years, basically. That was it. Wow. And then uh, we started and, and training was incredibly difficult because my instructor taught both arts simultaneously, Hapkido and Taekwondo. So when you tested, you tested for the ranks in both. So tests were doubly as hard. Um, and... Eventually, um, he made the switch, 
basically at the same time as we made the switch to just hop keto, um, I had uh, I had won the the, nine, the United States Taekwondo Championship in 1979 and 1980 in the super lightweight division, and then but I was in an explosion in the Middle East that had me in the hospital for 17 months. I was in the military at this time, and uh, that's when I realized my competitive career was over. And so I had five black belts at the time. I got with them. They had also tested in both arts. Asked them, did they want to continue? Did they want just Taekwondo, just Hapkido? What did they want? And all five of them, in about two seconds, voted they wanted Hapkido. So since you know 1983, I had taught only Hapkido. And then in, in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1993, that was 83. In 93, um, we decided to create the American Hapkido Alliance, a nonprofit organization, and that was because pressure we had gotten from the Korea Keto Association. It was financial pressure on um, this amount of money they wanted from us. So. And, and just so you know, as a side note, my instructor had never charged a dime for training, and I've never charged a student one cent, ever. Um, our students pay no tuition of any kind, nothing. Um, and so we founded this organization in 1993 as a nonprofit organization um, with a focus on the American student. Uh, you know, Hapkido has been here long enough, like a lot of the martial arts are, that we don't necessarily have to have the kowtow and hero worship um, of the Koreans that we used to have. Um, we've taken the martial arts and developed them, as evidenced when Taekwondo was admitted in the Olympics in 1988. You know, virtually every gold medal in every weight class, male and female, were won by Americans, which was quite a shock because it took place in Seoul, Korea. So it was a bit of an embarrassment to them, but it just shows that Americans have taken the martial arts and developed them maybe further than they had been previously. There was a lot so, in there. Sorry to make that a long answer. Yeah, no, no, I, I love the long answers and I love the detours, but I'm... I'm just not quite sure which piece to go back to first, because there, there are quite a few things that you, you shared with us there. I, I think, you know, rather than, than spending a lot of time talking about something that, you know, started out really negative, but clearly turned into something so positive and transformative, I think I just want to kind of underscore this idea that, that your, your instructor, who I believe you, you also referred to as your father. Yes. He changed your life. And I think a lot of times we get bogged down in whether it we're looking through the lens of martial arts or just being a human being on earth, that there's so much that we would like to do and it can be so overwhelming that we can't do it all. Well, here's someone who I'm sure made tremendous sacrifice and, and as you said, put himself at quite a bit of risk, but saved potentially literally your life. He, he definitely, there's no doubt in my mind that he saved my life. It would have probably taken an even worse turn at some point down the road, but he definitely saved my life. And I've tried to, our school is run, he was a very strict disciplinarian, although not physical. He was very, they, there was no tolerance. If I had ever tried a drug and he found out about it, there would have been no second chance. I mean, there's just, there's just no, you know, it was absolute black and white with him. And mm -hmm. so um, of course, that made me that way, too, which isn't always necessarily a good thing. But I try to instill that our school is run very, very much like a family. We socialize together. Every birthday is celebrated. Um, it's, it's a family because it's the only family I've ever known. I only have one. Nikolai is my biological son, and he's also a master instructor in the school. Um, that ranks up there with the proudest achievements of my life was him you know, reaching master level. My wife is a master instructor. Um, so we're, it's a very, very tight knit group, very, very, um, very family oriented, very, very focused. We call each other a family. We, like I said, we celebrate birthdays and Christmases and, and everything together. Um, I have a, a, a group of black belts that uh, I'm a very, very, I'm very demanding instructor. I mean, I expect a phone call if you're going to miss class from every student, every time, um, uh, it's it's very very strict. It's <laughs> I'm, I'm a strict disciplinarian, mm -hmm. and like he was, but he was a very loving man at the same time. And it was the first time in my life I had experienced that um, to, to, for someone to be that strict and loving at the same time. Yeah, I'm sure we have some of the the old guard out there nodding along as you're you're talking about that level of respect and discipline and just that kind of structure. Uh, I, I consider myself one of the younger members of the old school. I was raised in a very similar way. So I, I understand, I get it. And I think there's a lot of value in there for sure. Mm -hmm. That's a good origin story. I mean, certainly one of the best that we've had. I mean, clearly you could have 
gone a lot of different ways, but you ended up as this martial artist who's having an impact yourself. Outside of that story, I know you've got a bunch of other stories. I, I can't imagine with that beginning that life became boring and drab. It never so, has. It never has. <laughs> so if I was to ask you your favorite martial arts story, what would that be? There's a couple, but there's, there's one that really stands out because it taught me the value of realism in training and in close quarter combat. In 1976, I had just, right after I got my first degree black belt, I was 15, um, Mike Lee Chanis was stationed at Fort Bragg and he came to the school and talked to my father about sharing the, literally sharing the building on off class days. He wanted to start teaching there. He was, his, his, he was a driven man. His whole focus was to get Harong Do accepted into the military as a curriculum. Um, so that's what he was trying to do at that time. And, um, my father thought his, the technique was good, but he thought, um, that he introduced some very, very lethal things too early in people's training. Um, you know, putting knives in the, in the hands of white belts, that kind of thing. And, uh, so he, he would not let him share the building, but, uh, I trained for a year with Michael Ichanis on, on the opposite days. And what I, the, one of the, my favorite stories is, and it was quite a painful lesson. I'm looking at the scars on my hands right now. Um, he loved uh, single stick, double, double stick, cane, and knife fighting. And uh, I had been exposed to um, the cane and the double stick, but not actual knife fighting. And here I was at 15, and we were training with live blades. And they were probably, I don't think they would cut your arm off, so they probably weren't razor sharp, but they were live metal blades. And, and like I said, looking down at the, at the end of that first session, I had um, a couple of nice wounds, um, one that I look at right now on my wrist, um, but I was bleeding you know, pretty profusely. And it did teach me a lot about close quarter combat. And that was a driving force um, in my martial arts career from then on, which is one of the things that made me um, leave the Taekwondo behind because it's a, it's a wonderful sport, but it is a sport. And pursue the Hapkido because Hapkido, although it's a very old martial art, it's a very adaptive martial art, a very effective martial art, and, it, and it's constantly uh, adapting and reinventing itself. And when it comes down to weaponry and things like that, it's very, very practical. Um, we do a great deal of knife fighting, knife versus knife, um, because it's a weapon that anyone can carry. It doesn't require a license. And when you have a, a, a relatively good skill level with it, you can be very effective in self-defense. It's also a great equalizer against multiple opponents. So that was that was one of my favorite stories. He was. I have some interesting pictures, you know, of, of, of me and Ichanis, um hanging in the school, and it, it was. He was an interesting character. It was a shame that he died so young and so unexpectedly. It would have been interesting to see where his his future would have gone. Yeah. Wow. I'm just. I'm, I'm imagining you at 15. After that session with with the blood. Running down oh, yeah. your arms. It was me and me and my best friend. We had both gotten first degree black belt at the same time, and it, it actually my you know my family didn't really care, but my best friend was the son of a captain, a military captain, who was r outraged that his son had gotten cut. Um, so he, he actually, um, after training probably a month, his father would not allow him to continue with Ichanis, and I trained with him for a year. And the only reason I stopped after a year. Um, was because that's when he left and, and went to Nicaragua to train Somoza's bodyguards and subsequently was killed there, mm. uh, him and Chuck Sanders. But uh, it, it was an interesting year. It, it taught me a lot about actual, real, close quarter combat. So it was, it was, it was great. The other, the other thing that used to happen a lot, I had, there are too many stories to count because it was such a regular occurrence, was we used to have what was called the 13-month the, um, the Korean Wonders. I don't know if you know or not, but when you get stationed in Korea – uh, it's a 13-month tour. You're there for 13 months. Well, you go there. Most guys go there with no martial arts training, so you, you piddle around for the first two months. Then you decide you're going to go study. So at this point, you have 11 months left. 11 months later, you come back to the States, black belt in hand with a, with a legitimate certificate. And the first thing you want to do is go visit a school and test your skills. And this happened weekly. Sometimes they wanted to fight my father. Um, most of the time, they were very disrespectful about it. Sometimes they wanted to fight him. Sometimes they wanted to fight one of the other person, one of the other black belts in the class closer to their weight or whatever. But the outcome was always the same. And those were, they were actually quite comical to watch because it was, 
really, really sad because they thought because they had the certificate in hand and the spells were on their way, somehow magically these skills were going to appear. You know, unless you're just some incredibly gifted individual, you have a limited number of skills in 11 months. So they, those, were always, those were always entertaining to watch. Mm. You know, it, it's amazing to me that the birthplace of a martial art would hold back on teaching the respect, the integrity piece in favor of teaching the movement. It's a shame. It's all, it's all about the money. Um, yes. You know, it's, it's an embarrassment for me. It always has been. And I don't mean to step on any toes here, but it seems, you know, our art, the Koreans, uh, are the worst violators. And I really, I, I don't mean to say that, but it's renowned that they leave Korea second degree black belts and get off the plane here at seventh degrees. And, <laughs> and, and you, get a, you go to any major city in the U.S., pick up a Yellow Pages, and in every city, there's a 62 or 63 national Korean champion in every city. Um, and then, the, you know, then it comes into the, the exorbitant. I mean, I, I went to a school one time at, at, to visit because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And he had his testing fees were five thousand um, dollars. Which is just incredulous to me, especially since I don't I don't charge money to my students anyway. But and, and some, you know, if you're if you're trying to do this as a business, I get it. But there is a point where it becomes absurd, too. I mean, how many little Johnnies out there's parents can afford to pay $5,000 testing fees? Right. And how many of them should? Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's a sad state of affairs in, in that respect. Um, it, it, it's going to be curious where, where things go. I mean, there were a time we thought, okay, things can't get worse than this. And they have. Um, but... You know, I could do, I'm, I'm kind of a dinosaur, you know, Nikolai, my, my son kind of laughs. I'm, he had to help me here with the Skype. I'm not real computer savvy. I'm, I'm a dinosaur, but actually proud to be one. I'm buried in the past. I live my life, you know, with a certain amount of discipline and respect. And that, that's, that's kind of the world I choose to live in. Sure. Hey, no judgment here. I, I come from an IT background and there are many, many days that I wish I was a bit of a dinosaur when it came to technology. <laughs> outside the martial arts you know i'm not sure how much space there is for that you know it's clear how passionate you are are there other things that you enjoy there are when time permits i'm very very passionate and it's again it's something my wife and my son we've done together for many years um i really enjoy motorcycle riding um i'm, I'm very very passionate about it it's a it's a wonderful stress relief um you know, Nikolai was a hero in his high school. He got a brand new Harley Davidson for his 17th birthday. Wow. And so um, that's something we really, really enjoy. And I was a military dog trainer, so I still enjoy working with dogs um, just for the fun of it. Again, it's, it's, I have a job, so I don't, I don't really need to pursue the dollars in that. So it's just, it's just for the fun. Sure. And our, life, on, our lifestyle mainly is taken up by the martial arts, and, and we like it that way. <laughs> On behalf of the others listening that may ride, what do you ride? I have a 2015 Indian Chief, which I think I rode Harley for many years, but I think it is the it's the best bike I've ever owned and ridden from an engineering standpoint. And uh, it, it looks like it stepped out of 1955, which is what I love the most about it. Um, and my wife is, we're a house divided. She rides a Harley Davidson. Uh, my son rides an Indian, but he's but he's had Harley Davidson. So we are a house divided in that respect. But I, I just absolutely love it. <laughs> well, as someone who who rides and, and does not ride cruisers, I'm 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 still a little bit a little bit faster, a little little bit bent more bent forward than you oh, are you're, on you're on bike. my bike. I do, I do. Good. And my wife rode a Hayabusa for years. Wow. Um, I don't think she ever went over eighty miles an hour. She rode it because she liked the way it looked. <laughs> And she's a she's a six footer with a thirty seven inch inseam, so she can ride anything very comfortably and, and not be intimidated by the weight or anything. Wow, yeah, my my feet will not touch the ground on a Hayabusa. I, a good friend of mine has one. I've tried. Yeah, I would I, when I would mess around with hers, I'd be on my very tiptoes. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a little vertically challenged. <laughs> so we we heard about some some darker times. You know, fortunately not not too lengthy, at least in the way that you told it when you were a child. But I'd, I'd like you to think about a time after you had started training, you know, that you had some, some martial arts context for life. And about well, something that, you know, maybe went 
went haywire and how you were able to reflect or use your training to get past it? Well, I said uh, probably the major thing was I, I was in an explosion in the Middle East in, in um, 1982 and 17 months in the hospital makes you reflect a lot. Um, and but it, it also put me at a, you know, unwittingly, it put me at a crossroads um, as far as did I continue in a sport mode because I loved competition. Um, I, I won over 70 grand championships. Um, I won the Battle of Atlanta, which at that time was the premier tournament in the U.S. I won the U.S. Open. Um, but it, it it put me in that – once you real, when a thing like that happens, it's, the decision is taken away from you. Whether I want to devote my time to sport or to traditional martial art, that injury – because I have a total knee on the right side um, and my back was broken several places, um, my neck. And I've always been – anyone who knows me knows I've always been a kicker. I pride myself on my kicking techniques, my side kick straight up, um, even at 56. Um, so I had to, I had having to make that choice and the choice taken away from me. But in retrospect, it was, it was the best thing because I'm, uh, I made the right choice. Um, I think for the, for a career to continue in Taekwondo, it would have pushed me into a commercial venture. Um, and I'm glad I didn't go that route. I'm glad as well. Let, let's deviate a little bit from the order. Let's, let's talk about competition. You just mentioned competition there. So tell us a bit more about your time competing and, and what really drew you to it. Because you weren't these aren't local tournaments in middle schools that you're talking about. These are the biggest of the big. Yeah, we were very um, we, we were very into the tournaments when I, when I was a kid growing up on Fort Bragg. And you know, North Carolina had a very active tournament scene. So a lot of them were local, but then as I got older, um, I wanted to compete uh, on a more, on a grander scale. And just by virtue of circumstance, since I came here from Germany, I've always lived in the deep south, just by virtue of circumstance. And, you know, the upside of that was some of the biggest tournaments, you know, the Battle of Atlanta, uh, the U.S. Open, which at that time was still in St. Petersburg um, before Mike Sawyer bought it and put it at, at Disney. Um, so they were, you know, they were only a few hours drive. So that was really the rent, the main, you know, motivation to being able to go to those tournaments. The first time I ever traveled to a tournament was when in 1979, when, uh, the national Taekwondo championships was, was held in LA. Um, and I, I took, a my commander gave me the time off cause it was a big boost, you know, publicity wise to the military and, and me and my father, we flew a Mack flight, which was a military transport plane um, because we couldn't afford commercial flights. So we hopped a Mack flight to L.A. Um, but that was the first time I'd ever traveled. I'd always, I had always, I had wished that I could have um, competed in Ed Parker's Internationals, which back then in the 70s and 80s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, was uh, the premier tournament to win. Um, and it was, and it was a lot of that was because of location. You know, it was L.A. basically, and and so anybody who who wanted to be in the martial arts film industry or anything like that, flocked to L.A. And so you had the cream of the crop of martial artists there. And uh, so I would have loved to compete there, but I, I didn't. Most of my competition were, you know, in the in the East Coast and Southeast Coast. And I enjoyed competition very much. And, and I was a very successful tournament fighter, but my real passion was forms competition. Um, and I still love forms. And, and it translates today how Keto doesn't have forms, but... I'm a stickler on my students for kicking form, for stances. I'm very, very strict on it. Um, so form is, is you know, primar you know, primarily my main focus in any technique that they do. So the competition, I got that from competition. I realized because in forms competition, you know, you, you can't score a lucky point. You're out there by yourself on your own merit. Um, so it, it teaches you a lot about yourself. And uh, it taught me over the years that I, I love having – Ex dancers or ex gymnasts as students because they understand the concept of form before anything. So it, it, it was very good to me in that respect. But I don't. I also at the same time don't miss it. That was a, you know that was that phase of my life. Um, I was a young lion because um, I was 23 years old when the explosion happened. So my career ended at a very young age or a relatively young age. But I don't really miss it because it forced me to focus on teaching, which is my my true love. So if I was to ask you who the most influential person in your martial arts would be, that's a pretty obvious answer. We've, we've heard about that, man. Pretty powerful stuff there. But who, uh, would be, who would be second on that list? 
Oh, that's a very easy answer for me. That would be Grandmaster Dr. He Young Kim in out of Louisiana. Actually, just after 40 years in Louisiana, he um, just decided he wanted to move to Atlanta. But uh, he was one of the first top keto instructors in the United States. And he has written, I don't, I don't know if you know or not, but he has written a series of nine books. Each one of those books is over 700 pages, very large book, glossy paper. The books weigh 10 pounds each and just thousands upon thousands of techniques. And he's always been very friendly to me and my students. Um, I respect him definitely more than any any other um, Korean instructor that I know. Um, and he was able to carve out quite a niche for himself, uh, that, which is what enabled him to publish those books because they're very expensive to publish. And he sells them you know, for $130, which hardly covers the cost of them in their, in their production. But he was able to finagle himself. Um, years ago, he got a position as the dean of Andrew Jackson State College in Baton Rouge. And even more importantly, was able to get Hapkido entered into the curriculum of the college. So students would go in there. By the time they graduated four years later, their official degree was a degree in physical education. But the culmination of their degree was a test of their fertility black belt. Mm. So he, he's a very influential man. He's a very humble man. We just trained together at Tom Gordon's um, Korean Martial Arts Festival, which uh, – is um, every April. It's a fantastic event. You know, everyone that you read about in the magazines, because my students are relatively isolated here in Daytona. And since top keto stylists don't compete, that's one of the few chances they get to meet other martial artists. So it's a, it's a wonderful event. But he was, this was the second year that he was there. And I hadn't seen him actually in, in 20 years. And he's 77 years old now. So I'm very, very fortunate that my students got to meet and train with him. But he is very, very influential in my life. And his books... Um, Hapkido, Hapkido 2, Kuksul, and Philosophy of Masters are required purchase for each rank of black belt from first degree to fourth degree black belt. That's part of their testing fee are his books. Hmm. So he is, he's just a wonderful man. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. There are plenty of people who have written books on the martial arts, but I don't, I don't know that I can name anyone who has written 90 pounds of yeah, martial it's, arts it's un- books. It's, it's unbelievable. The, the yeah. quality of the books and the photographs, I mean, it's just, it's hard to believe that the books, you know, would sell for $129. It's just amazing to me, um, just in the financial cost of producing the book itself, not counting the, the writing of the book, but just the production of the books. It's, it's just amazing to me. Sounds like an impressive man. He is. He is. And he's a very humble man. I like that. Now, if you could train with someone that you haven't, and that could be anyone, anywhere in time, alive, and dead, doesn't matter. Who would that be? I'd have to give that some thought. I didn't realize you were going to throw that you haven't trained with because my answer was going to be my father. Just to get, just to have him back for a little while. I felt like there was so much more that we had to accomplish. And he died at a point where my son hadn't been training all that long. So he didn't get the benefit uh, of his knowledge and his skill and his wisdom um, because he was taken from us so young. So um, that would be my answer. But saying that I haven't trained with, man, that's that's a tough one. Um, there's a lot of martial arts that I have you know, a lot of respect for. But um, I, if it weren't for him, I would think that I would have loved to have spent some time with Young Sol Choi, who was the founder of Hapkido. Um I would have liked to have spent some time with him because he had an in- his life was an interesting story too. He was taken by force from Korea to Japan, um, forced to be a servant during the Japanese occupation of Korea, but at the same time was taken in by Sokaku Takeda, who was at that point the grandmaster of Daituru Aikijitsu. So he learned, he eventually started to teach him and he became his assistant. So he learned the Aikijitsu hand techniques, the throws and the joint locks. And then when he did come back to Korea, combined them with the Korean kicking techniques of Taekyeon and created Hapkido. So it's quite an interesting transition. I would have loved, if nothing else, just to talk to him for a little while. Mm-hmm. It, this is one of my favorite questions to ask because it, it, it forces people to step out of what, what is and what they have done and consider you know, this kind of fictional tangent to reality. Sure. Sure. And I think it says a lot about what is important to our guests. Mm-hmm. You know, you're talking about having a conversation. You're talking yes. about your grandmaster, your father, and unfinished work and, and wanting to connect 
your son with him more. You know, it's, I think just, just looking at that a lot says who you are. And just well, kind of my, my observation. Although his, his death wasn't, it wasn't exactly sudden. He hid the illness from us because at this point we were living in Florida and he was still in North Carolina. He retired at Fort Bragg, had a house there. And I used to take my students up there every six months to train with him. Um, we pile in the car and another funny story there was, I, I'm always blessed with the financially poorest students on earth. So we would, it was an eight hour drive. So we would pile in the car here Friday night at midnight, drive all the way through the night, Fort Bragg, get there at eight in the morning, stop by a Hardee's or Burger King for breakfast, and then go train for four or five hours, take him to dinner and then do the, the eight hour drive back. So we would do this thousand mile run plus training in 24 hours. So it had been a few months and we were almost due to go back up there and he was very, very sick. And we finally got the call that he was much sicker than we thought. So my wife and my son and I immediately, we dropped everything that day, got in the car, drove through the night to get there. And it, I was shocked. Um, my father in his prime was 5'10". He had uh, a 59 inch chest and a 34 inch waist. He was just like, he looked like a black um, Lou Ferrigno, just massive, massive man. And to see him fight and move, I mean, his jump kicks were phenomenal, but he was this big man. Well, we got to the hospice center. We're walking in the hall, and I look in this one room, and I see this little man laying on the, on the bed, and we kept walking, and then it dawned on me that was him. We walked into the room, and he was probably, and he was 260 pounds, and he was probably 120 pounds, and I, I cried like an infant. I cried like a baby. And it took me a while to compose myself. And he, you know, he, the smile never left his face. He wasn't in any pain. And uh, that's when we sat down and talked. And, and like I said, my wife was there and my son was there. And um, there were three of us seventh degree black belts. He had three seventh degrees. And I thought it would, one of them, like I said, Grandmaster Jim McMurray in Texas was the assistant when I was the beginner. And I knew that one of us three would be the new Grandmaster of the American Alpedo Alliance. And I thought it would be one of them too. And then he told me he wanted me to take over. Although it was a great honor, it was also a great burden. And I, I trade it. This is, this is a hard job. This isn't a job I asked for, but he asked me to do it. And so I take it very, very seriously. But it is, it's a lot of worry and it's a, it's a lot of work and it's a heavy responsibility. And I think my son knows that one day this will, this will be heaped on him. And it's, he sees how hard it is. But uh, it, was, it was probably the, maybe the hardest day of my life. Um, it was awful. And certainly that's not a circumstance that is unique to you. And I don't, I don't say that to take away oh, any, no, any of the pain or, or, or sure. but I know that there are, are folks out there who either have been part of this happening or, or, or maybe, you know, things were handed, handed down. Succession plan is not something that we discuss often in the no. martial arts. So I'm curious if you don't mind sharing, are there things that you've done to prepare your son for stepping into oh. your role? Oh, I think so. I'm, I'm very, very hard on my son. Um, but at the same time, I couldn't be prouder of him. Um, you know, he, this Saturday will be his 28th birthday. He's a master instructor. It took him longer than other people. I held him back slowly on ranks through the years. Um, but he is a martial scholar. He is... Um, He's in chiropractic college. My wife is a professor at chiropractic. She's also a chiropractor, but she's a professor at the chiropractic college. So he um, is in his first quarter of chiropractic school. So it's three and a half year school. Um, but it's still a very, very, and that's a hard program. And it's, but he's still a very, very focused martial artist. He's never done a drug in his life. Um, it's just, he, he's constantly, con he's opened a new world for me as far as the internet goes, because he's constantly sending me videos and and things like that that are things that i didn't even know existed um or, or films that i didn't know were around uh, he sent me one the other day of grandmaster bo sim mark she's in boston and i have pictures of her and i competing against each other in forms competent weapons forms back in the 70s well a lot of people don't know because of the difference in names she is donnie yen's mother who played he played yip man and um one two and i think is there a third movie mm -hmm. He's, he played Yet Man. He's, a, he's a, a doing very well as a martial artist. But that's his yes. mother, um, and I didn't I didn't even realize that these video that anybody bothered filming some of these videos. So he is constantly 
researching. He is mm. he's well prepared and going to be even better prepared. And I've got a great group of black belts. They are incredibly, incredibly dedicated. Uh, Brian Friedman, Kira Smith, and and Ryan Rodriguez. They are they're incredibly dedicated because I'm, I put a lot of demands on my students. Um, I will ask a history question on Japanese Kyokushinkai karate in the middle of class. I'll ask somebody a history question and a wrong history answer. And these, you know, these they're studying Hapkido, but a wrong history question is 100 push-ups. Um, so I put a lot of demands on them. Uh, they, it's important to be a martial scholar. I can, you can teach anybody a front kick and a reverse punch, but it's important to be a martial scholar. I feel my students should be able to go to any school of any style, visit there respectfully, and before they walk in the door, have at least a basic understanding of what that style is about, the basic premises of those styles. So I'm, I'm very, and that's even the white belts. Um, I'm very, very hard. That is hard. That's a high standard. But one of my favorite sayings is that people are like goldfish. They will grow to the size of the bowl you put them in. Yes, they will. So I'm sure you see a, a lot of them rising to that occasion, trying to reach that oh, absolutely. that absolutely. expectation. And I, I'm wondering maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing some of those photos with you and Bows and Mark. Oh, sure. Um, listeners, especially recent listeners to the show, will remember that on episode 212, we had one of Bows and Mark's students, Sifu Jean oh, really? Lukic, on. Yes, I've, um, I've managed to make contact with, with her and a few others that are in that world and um, some things that aren't formed well enough that I can release them on the show, but but I can tell you once we're done recording, uh, I'm, I'm not too far from Boston, so we'll just oh, we'll okay. just kind of realize you're on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, I'm in Vermont, so we'll oh, we'll just kind of leave it at that. I'll, I'll let let right. the listeners wonder. That drives them crazy. Sure, <laughs> I have fun doing that. So yeah, yeah, some of those photos would be a lot of fun. I enjoy sure. that history as, as well. I'm I, I can't say that I could step into any school and answer history questions on any style. <laughs> But uh, but I like that idea, the yeah. idea of a martial scholar. Now you mentioned movies. You mentioned the, the Ip Man films. Do you do you enjoy martial arts movies? Is that something that you know the the time I, that you started martial arts? I mean, that was kind of the heyday of the kung fu film. Oh my God, we used to we, it, from from um, Fort Bragg downtown to Fayetteville was fourteen miles, and we were you know we weren't licensed drivers yet. Me and a couple of my friends, including my best friend, we would ride our bicycles down. Saturday. On Saturday, we had class from 11 to 3. Saturday class was four hours. And then after class, we'd get on our bicycles, ride the 14 miles downtown Fayetteville. And there was a street called Hay Street, which was, although our junior high school was at the end of this street, it, the street, that street dead end into our junior high school, the street itself was nothing but bars and hookers and it was a really bad street, but there was a theater down there that would play this continuous loop of really awful Chinese kung fu movies. And back then it was a dollar to get in, and they just – you could sit through all of them, and then they would start all over. And we would sit there half the night watching these films. We did this every Saturday. Um, but generally, as far as martial arts movies go, not martial arts movies per se. You can, there are only so many ways of doing something under the sun before it gets old. But there are a couple of movies that I never get tired of, and I actually make them required viewing for my students. One is The Challenge. It was done in 1982, and it starred Scott Glenn, who went on to star in a lot of movies, you know, Silence of the Lambs and, and um, Urban Cowboy. But he, uh, it was him and Toshiro Mifune, who was regarded kind of as the Japanese John Wayne. And the great thing about the movie is it, it shows the difficulties Americans have adapting to the respect, the obedience, and the discipline of, of an Asian martial art. So it's a great illustration of that because he, he resists it in the beginning you know, with a foul mouth and a foul attitude and then comes around. And the other one, of course, is um, the other film that uh, – there are many films that I make required viewing for the students. But the other one that really strikes home with me is The Last Samurai. Even though I'm not a great Tom Cruise fan, the storyline is phenomenal and he did a great job in it. So those two films are I really enjoy. I never get tired of watching them. And you wouldn't necessarily call them martial arts movies per se. No, not in the way that we typically think of them. It's there's I, I haven't seen the challenge, but the Last Samurai certainly has a plot. Oh, you and, have to see the and you some have to see acting. The challenge, <laughs> the challenge is is, is as good. It's as good as 
The Last Samurai. And then, of course, um, Billy Jack is, for, yeah. you know, for its significance, that it was the first film to ever display Hapkido, first Western film to display Hapkido. And it was a it was a great, uh, great, great film done on, you know, on talk about a shoestring budget. But the park fight scene in Billy Jack is still considered today by many people as the greatest movie fight scene ever filmed. And the reason that was was because Bong Su Han spoke basically no English. So he had these stuntmen who weren't professional stuntmen. They were local townspeople in Scottsdale, Arizona during the filming that volunteered to kind of be stuntmen. Well, they weren't prepared that he was going to kick them and hit them full power. So he broke a couple jaws. He dislocated a couple shoulders. That's why it was so realistic. Because it was but real. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenal fight scene. And, of course, um, the movie was so controversial at the time um, because of the Vietnam War and, and racism and things like that. That was a – it. It, it stepped on a lot of toes. Um, so, um, but it, it really opened the doors for Hapkido in America. Yes. Yeah. We did an entire profile episode on Billy Jack because it's such an important piece of martial arts culture. It, it really is the first modern martial arts movie in the United States. And, and still today, the highest grossing independent film of all time. Yes. I do remember that. Yeah. And and of course one of the greatest lines of all time. I'm going to put my take my left foot and put it on that side of your on that side of your face. Right. I mean who doesn't (laughs) who doesn't love that line if you've seen that movie? And if you haven't seen that movie, you have to. And of course, good time to mention the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, all the things we talk about and photos and all the other good stuff goes over there if you want to check those out later. I hope that you do. Now you mentioned movies. How about actors? Is there anyone that when you watch them, you say that person? Um, I would say it's, uh, it sounds almost like a cliche, but it would be Chuck Norris. And But the reason I picked Chuck Norris is because um, of all the actors and, and you know, martial arts personalities out there, he was a true world champion. You can't take that from him. It wasn't an imagined title. But more importantly than that, he has never done anything on film or in his personal life, in his real life, to discredit the martial arts or to embarrass the martial arts or himself. Um, he has, he has held himself to an amazing standard all these years. Um, and that, that, that gets, that gets my respect. Yeah. I I mean, he wasn't the greatest, he's not the greatest kicker, didn't have the greatest flexibility. Um, but you know, his, his martial arts techniques are very, very good. And, and, and he always, you know, he's always been shown in a positive light because he's lived his life in a positive light. He yes. never embarrassed himself in any way. He's reminded me that I'm not a huge football fan, but somebody that comes to mind in football is Emmett Smith of the Dallas Cowboys. You know, had a, had an unbelievable career and never did anything to embarrass himself, his team, or his family. Nothing. No scandal. He, he was he was a class act. I I came mm-hmm. up uh, yep. when when I was a boy. I was a big 49ers fan, and of course, anybody that they may remember the nineties. It was the mm-hmm. Niners and the Cowboys for quite a few years. And yeah, you had to have respect for Emmett Smith and you know, Chuck Norris was no slouch in the ring. I, I, he oh, he no, doesn't no, no. often I... get the credit he deserves. And, and as good as he was, you know, the era he was in, he held his own against I mean, Joe Lewis and, and Bill Wallace oh, and these other absolutely amazing names. So absolutely. Um, you know, the other, one of the other, great kickers of that era was a, a man that didn't get a lot of limelight attention him was skipper mullins from texas mm-hmm. and he was he was very long-legged and very thin and he was a phenomenal kicker but you know the first time chuck norris entered entered the ring and scored with a spinning back kick people just gasped you know that it just wasn't done it was it was primarily japanese arts then and it was front kick reverse punch or lead leg side kick and you know, he does he does the spinning back kick and people were just amazed no his skills were real and, and phenomenal but he was you know he never had the flexibility to say jean claude van damme he never had a straight up side kick um things like that but it, it doesn't take away from his abilities at all at all no he, he, no that i could never detract from his abilities no he was a true fighter he was a gentleman in the ring and fought anybody there was to fight and beat most anybody there was to beat at the time that's right now, books. You mentioned um, books, and and just to to kind of loop it into this section, the the gentleman with the Hapkido books that you mentioned before. What was the name of that series, or or at least uh, his name? The author is it's Doctor He Young Kim. Okay. 
And the, the first book he wrote was, it was just titled Hapkido. And he wrote these as his curriculum for um, the students that were enrolled in the physical education program at Andrew Jackson State College. That's how it all came to be. And then everybody wanted these books. And so then he wrote Hapkido Volume 2. And then he wrote Kuksul because at the time, in 1975 till about 79, um, him and the Grand Master of Kuksul in Yuxu, they had attempted to unify Hapkido and Kuksul one because the two arts were so similar. The only difference being Kuksul had forms. And so for a time, um, Dr. Kim was secretary general of the World Cook Soul Association. And then they split around 79 when they decided it, it was a power struggle and they decided it, it just wouldn't work. Um, but back then we were called Cook Soul Hapkido for a time. And so the third book he wrote was while he was serving as secretary general of the Cook Soul Association. And it's called Cook Soul. Again, 700 pages. Um, then the fourth book uh, is the fourth one that I require for my students. It's called Philosophy of Masters. And it's just it's 700 pages of Korean philosophy with wonderful photographs. And then uh, then he wrote and he created his own organization called Han Mudo. And there's a Han Mudo text manual. Um, then he wrote um, History of Hapkido and Korea. That's the title of the book. And again, it's unbelievably in depth. My father is mentioned in it. Um, and then he wrote this definitive work. The last work was... Um, it's just called Taekwondo and again, just, just a wealth of information, but I have, I have several hundred books. I'm a voracious reader. Um, and back when I first started training, I felt it necessary when I got a book to, uh, put the date inside the cover when I bought it. And I was looking the other day, the first book I ever bought is written inside of it, uh, uh in December of 72. And it was uh, by Doc Sung Sun. It was called Korean Karate, which was one of the first books written on, on Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. That was my first book. But I have hundred. I'm, I'm a voracious reader. What do you like about martial arts books? You know, it, it's it's this quietly polarizing thing. It seems in in our world. Well, as I tell my students, because Hapkido, especially. Um, I mean, I love all martial arts, and I I glean something from every martial art that I ever come in contact with. But what I love about Hapkido is. Um, the art is so fluid and because of the, the, the devil is in the details in Hapkido techniques, because I, 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 one student comes to mind, I have a student right now that's uh, 250 pounds. He squats 800 pounds. He's just a beast. He's, he's in chiropractic college. That's how he came to me. And he's just a beast. He can, I think he can lift a car. You know, he's just, just a beast. But I have, I, I've made him squeal like a pig with a finger lock. Um, so it, it's, it's a great, um, reiteration and reinforcement. But the thing about Hapkido is, and a lot of martial arts like Hapkido, whether it's Harang Do or Kuksul or Aikijitsu, for example, you can, they're a great learning tool if you're training, but you could not learn Hapkido from a book if you weren't training in Hapkido. Um, because a book is static in a still photo. So you can't see circular motion. You can't see the water principle in a static photo. And then if you try to do it by video, you couldn't get close enough on the detail of where the fingers are on this wrist lock or this pressure point. So they're a great, great supplement. And I, I insist that my students read, um, but they're just that they're a supplement. I agree. Let's talk about your goals. I mean, you've, you've got, you've got your organization, you know, we, we've been able to piece together quite a few things that you've got going on and we've got, you know, we, we know how, the trajectory has gotten you to here, but where is it carrying you? Well, my focus now is is to prepare my son. Um, there have been some amazing parallels in, in his life and my life. For example, uh, I was born the year the Berlin Wall went up and divided the two Germanys. He was born the year the wall came down. Um, he got his fourth dan at the same age that I got my fourth dan. He started training one year different from the age I was when I started training. So there's some amazing similarities there and some amazing parallels. But I am trying. But now, because I'm a little older and I hope a little smarter, I can look back and see the kind of master I was at 28, and you know, with 15, 16 years training, and realize some of the mistakes I made. So trying to curtail some some of those mistakes on him. Um, also, that Hapkido. Our, our curriculum anyway, we have a very strict, very detailed curriculum. Every kick is learned in a particular order, every throw in a particular order. 
So taking the curriculum and making sure we understand it inside out. Um, and we do a lot of things for our students that are different than a commercial school. Um, our black belt uniforms are custom made for us in Korea. Um, our black belts are custom made and custom embroidered. I, I really feel want my students to feel like if they earn first degree black belt or higher, it's really a special thing. So those things have to be coordinated. So he's at the age now. I'm sorry. I'm starting to feel my mortality a little bit is scaring me because my father was only, you know, seven years older than I am now when he passed. So it's made me think that a little bit, and it was very unexpected and very southern. Um, so I want my son to be prepared. So that's my, my primary focus. Um, and to have my students reach the, you know, the, the best potential skill level that they can. Um, my, my entire focus is, is the well-being and the advancement of my students. That's it. I mean, there are many other instructors that um, it's never really meant much to me when somebody says, I, you know, I have 500 black belts. Well, I have 23. Out of those 23, six have reached master level. And I'm very, very happy with that. It, it just doesn't mean much to me. I don't know you would ha how you would have enough days in the week and enough enough months in the year to produce 500 black belts. Uh, that escapes me, but it's it's also none of my business. So my, my focus and my goals are relatively simple, and that's train every day. I mean, I'm 56 years old. I still get thrown. Um, I fight. I'm on the mat every day. Um, I would never sit back and, and just bark out commands. I, I, I train alongside my students. Um, so that's just, that's just my focus is to get better than I am. I don't necessarily feel like my, I don't feel like I've, I'm past my prime. I, I think martial arts are a journey. When I was 28 years old, I was busy, you know, doing, you know, 540 degree jump spinning hook kicks. And with my, I have a total knee on the right side now. So it forced me to get better hands. So my pressure point techniques and, and my joint locks have gotten better. So I think it's, it's just part of the evolution, and, but that evolution doesn't stop. I like that. All right. Now for the people listening, if they'd like to reach you or, you know, know what you've got going on, if they're going to swing by your area, could they drop in, you know, any of that kind of commercial time stuff? Why don't you let us have that? Yeah. Um, they can find us on um, the American Apito Alliance on Facebook. Um, my son and my wife both administer that a great deal. So they can contact us that way. They can contact us, um, by telephone, um, which sounds kind of antiquated, but I, I, I will pick up the phone. I will answer. <laughs> um, and you know, my phone number is 407-474-0989. Um, my son's is, uh, 386-466-4419. One four. Um, we're always glad, and we, we love visitors. Um, anybody is welcome to come by the school. Um, you know, come with respect, but we we love visitors, and and I and I have my student. I insist that my students visit other schools that are receptive to the idea uh, to be respectful to learn about other martial arts. It's, it's very very important. Again, that comes down to the martial scholar thing. So it's very very important that they visit other schools and and see how other schools do things. I agree. I agree. That's that's a subject we've talked about on the show, not a lot, but but a bit to say it's uh, it's important to round that out. No one person has all of the answers. Absolutely. This has been wonderful. I appreciate your time. I appreciate all the, the wonderful stories and the, the wisdom you've shared with us. But I'd like to trouble you for one more thing, and that's to, to send us out, you know, send us out on a high note, if you will. Well, there are two things that I tell my students that I try to live my life by. One is to Never put profit before principle, because even if you win, you lose. Um, I don't begrudge anybody who teaches martial arts for a living, um, but I do begrudge people who sell the martial arts. There's a big difference. So never put profit before principle. And the other thing is I'm a warrior not because I would always win, but because I would always fight. Hands down, Grandmaster Farrelly just seems like a wonderful person. I had a blast talking to him. His compassion is dedication to teaching really deserves recognition. Few people are able to move forward from the type of start that he had. And that really just, that really stuck with me throughout the entire conversation. I'd venture to say his students are incredibly loyal and it was a lot of fun to speak with him. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you, Grandmaster Ferrelli, for coming on the show. Over at the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find a number of photos of Grandmaster Ferrelli as well as some other 
fun stuff that we're including there. So definitely want to check that out. If you want to find us, we're on social media. We're at Whistlekick pretty much everywhere you can imagine. And of course, don't forget marshalljournal.com. No hyphens or anything like that. Just M-A-R-T-I-A-L journal, J-O-U-R-N-A-L.com. Look forward to all the wonderful content that all these people that we've connected with are going to produce over the next forever and look forward to your feedback because we made this for you. So check it out. And if you have something that you'd like to add, we want to know. I haven't mentioned the newsletter in a few episodes. So if you aren't on the newsletter list, that's how we communicate with our audience the most, the most direct. Check that out. You can sign up at any of our websites, except Marshall Journal. We're not going to do that there. That is not a Whistlekick site. It's for everybody. But at whistlekick.com or whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the sign up there. Get in on that newsletter. We send out sometimes three a month. Not a lot. Just to let you know what's going on, give you some discounts on some products. I'm going to stop talking now because I want you to go on and do something great with the rest of your time today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.